Good morning, and welcome to today's IAC webinar, Introduction to Radiation Safety for CT. My name is Michelle Farley, and I am the Administrative Support Coordinator with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, use the Questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar, as we will monitor questions throughout the presentation and try to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A period. Also on the left sidebar is the Resources tab. Click on this tab for a link to today's handout a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select the file name to download the handout. Lastly, in the lower left of the player, please note the Request Support button. If you experience any technical problems during this webinar, click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, Look to the right of the slides and click the Notes tab. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the ASRT CE credit, you must be registered, logged into this webinar, then complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure that you are individually registered and individually logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have a record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. This webinar is a joint presentation of IAC and ASRT. And now I would like to welcome our guest presenter today, Bob Pizzutiello. Bob is a New York State licensed medical physicist in diagnostic imaging, nuclear, imaging, and medical health physics. Currently, he serves as treasurer on the IAC Board of Directors and as president-elect on the IAC CT Board of Directors, also representing the American Association of Physicists in Medicine. He brings over 35 years of experience in the field of medical radiation, teaching technologists, and physicians about radiation safety. And we are very happy to have him with us today. With that said, I will now turn this webinar over to our today's speaker, Bob Zutielo. Well, thanks very much, Michelle. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be with everybody today. Uh, we are, of course, all getting more and more familiar with these remote forms of communication and sharing information. And um, I think that today's will be useful in, in many respects. Uh, there are, I have no disclosures. Uh, I am on the board as, uh, as Michelle just mentioned. I oftentimes have people ask me, well, what is a medical physicist? And what do you do exactly? Uh, <clears throat> there is a definition on the American Association of Physicists in Medicine website that's here and is in your handout, and it explains what it is. But I think that a simpler explanation is this, <clears throat> the essential responsibility of the qualified medical physicist's clinical practice is to assure the safe and effective delivery of radiation to achieve a diagnostic or therapeutic result as prescribed in patient care. The medical physicist performs or supervises the technical aspects of procedures necessary to achieve this objective. So essentially, the way I explain this to my mom is that physicians, radiologists, and other physicians 
learn to practice medicine and to interpret images. Radiologic technologists learn how to operate the images, position the patients to get the optimal images, and medical physicists were sort of the technical liaison between them and the patient to try to achieve the optimal result in patient care. <clears throat> so this is about radiation safety training, and why is it required? Well, the purpose is to give you some techniques to reduce your own exposure and patient exposure, to help you with background information because patients ask questions, and this will help you to answer questions from patients. Annual radiation safety is re required by many, but not all, state and federal regulations. It's a good practice to periodically update your skills and have a chance to ask questions about important radiation safety topics. Once a year, take a little time out and we do this. There is a requirement for radiation safety from the IAC. In fact, if you look at the IAC standards and guidelines, there are new versions that were revised in September of 2018, and they describe this requirement. If a medical physicist or qualified expert provides radiation tra safety training for facility staff members, documentation must include a minimum of three hours of CME related to radiation safety and some other details. So I mention this because this is one of those three hours. So at the completion of this, when you receive your certificate, you will have one of the three hours that are required. Why is radiation safety, dose and quality of concern to me? Well, CT is a significant source of radiation dose to the public and patients do ask questions. There are increasingly more state regulations regarding CT. And there is not uncommonly flawed science used for marketing purposes. In addition, cone beam CT has recently become integrated into many medical specialty and dental practices. So more people are now using cone beam CT than ever before. <clears throat> this is an interesting overview of a slide to show how cone beam CT is used in a dental practice. And that's become a, a relatively new focus of IAC because more and more dental practices are installing cone beam CTs. Of course, the, we see you know, the traditional whole body CT scanners. Uh, this is a, just one example of a, a whole body CT scanner and IAC accredits those. And then also this is sort of a traditional uh, ENT or a dental scanner that has this appearance. However, in more recent years, dental cone beam CT has become much more complex. Instead of being very simple, some of the manufacturers have multiple different versions, which will allow you to, the user to take larger and larger images and a more diverse set of images on their patients. In one of the manufacturers, they have nearly 10 different field sizes to produce different images from small images of the teeth two images of the entire, of the entire uh, head, not head, but the sinuses. <clears throat> uh, also in recent years, we've seen the development of extremity systems. So CareStream now has an extremity system, cone beam CT. And these are just a couple of slides. If you've not seen them, they provide advantages because you can get now weight bearing standing imaging and imaging of the upper extremities as well that are not possible in conventional CT scanners. So what are the advantages of cone beam CT? Well, the irradiated field of view is reduced to the region of interest. Mechanical collimation can be used or electronic masking, but remember only mechanical collimation, collimation meaning squeezing down the X-ray field size to the area of interest with, with lead apertures that are controlled by the operator, that is the only way to reduce the volume of tissue irradiated. If we look at a brief comparison of multi-detector CT versus cone beam CT, you'll see that there are many similarities. The X-ray source is much higher power in a multi-detector cone beam CT. The detector is very different, a multi-detector array versus a flat panel for cone beam. And the spatial resolution is pretty comparable at somewhere less than a half millimeter. In 2009, the National Council on Radiation Protection published report number 160 
on the exposure of population of the United States to ionizing radiation. And this was really the origin of a lot of our recent focus in the last 15 or so years on radiation dose reduction in CT. And if we take a look at how the, back, how the amount of average radiation dose by the average American has changed, in the early 1980s, 15% of it came from medical radiation. And in 2006, just under half of it came from medical radiation. And then a little deeper dive, it turned out that conventional radiography and fluoroscopy was the major contributor in 1980. And then in 2006, again, CT was dramatic and just under half of the contributor to dose for the American public. <clears throat> Here's a slide from the report that estimates the number and collective doses from various medical imaging categories. And what you can see here is that CT is at the top. It's got the, the highest collective dose and the per capita dose. So CT has grown had grown dramatically from 1993 to 2006. Nearly 62 million CT procedures were performed in 2006. Pediatric ac accounted for about 10% of the total procedures. <coughs> uh, in 2009, the NCRP uh, uh, issued a press relief which basically summarized this to say the increase in dose was mostly due to higher utilization of CT and nuclear medicine. So that's the reason why there's been a lot of focus on CT radiation dose. Let's, let's go back and talk about a few of the basics of radiation. I'm sure this is familiar and review for everyone, but again, sometimes it's helpful to ask, to answer questions from your patients or even from your family. Ionizing radiation is a form of electromagnetic radiation where each the energy is carried in a bundle that we call a photon, and the energy of that photon is enough to break chemical bonds, especially those on DNA molecules. Examples of ionizing radiation are X-rays and gamma rays. Non-ionizing radiation is radiation where <clears throat> there's not enough energy to break those bonds, and only thermal effects can be produced. So examples of ionizing radiation, I'm sorry, examples of electromagnetic radiation that are not ionizing are MRI, microwaves, and lasers. Of course, we all know that ultrasound is not an electromagnetic radiation and can only produce thermal and mechanical effects. We are able to see electromagnetic radiation in a very narrow range of the electromagnetic spectrum that we call the visible spectrum only because the rods and cones in our eyes are sensitive to electromagnetic energy in this range. So when those photons in this range are absorbed, then the rods and cones convert that electromagnetic energy to nerve impulses that are interpreted by the brain as light and color. We are not able to see x-rays because our senses simply cannot detect electromagnetic energy in this range. So we're unable to see x-rays at all. What about the terminology used for radiation? The term x-rays is commonly used and really means that it's radiation that arises from interactions with electrons. But the easy way to remember it is if it comes from a device that you plug in that takes power from the wall, then that's going to be x-rays, as opposed to gamma rays, which arise from interaction with nuclei, and those are produced by radioactive materials such as technetium and thallium. The units that we use to measure radiation are the Rentgen, which is an old unit that measures exposure in air, the RAD, which is a unit that measures exposure, uh, absorbed dose in tissue, and the more common newer unit is the gray, and one gray equals 100 rads. The REM is a term that's also used, and it stands for radiation equivalent man. But for practical purposes, these are all the same within a few percent. Uh, and in fact, we use small amounts, so we're talking about MR, milligray, or millirem. You will hear the term effective dose used. An effective dose is a term that was developed by scientists to compare the risk 
between exposures to different organs. Clearly, if the whole body is absorbed to radiation, that's a different risk than if just, for example, the lower extremity is exposed to radiation. So the effective dose is calculated by determining the absorbed dose to each organ and multiplying it by a weighting factor that has been determined by the International Commission on Radiation Protection. It's designed to compare the carcinogenic risk from a localized exposure to the mass of data that we have primarily from Hiroshima and Nagasaki survivors, those individuals who survived received whole body exposure. Natural background radiation is everywhere. It comes from the earth, it's terrestrial sources, cosmic, and also from each of us because we are each a small source of radiation. It, the natural background radiation varies by the location. The largest single source is radon, and that varies locally, but it's approximately something like 200 millirem per year. Typical natural, back, natural background radiations excluding radon are on the order of 60 millirem in the Northeast, Eastern, Western, and Central states, uh, lower in the Atlantic and Gulf Coastal states, about 45, and higher in the Colorado Plateau, about 100 millirem. So in general, if I round these numbers up, that's about 100, add about 200 from radon, so it's about one millirem per day is the natural background radiation. So here's a slide that basically shows exactly that. I'd like to talk for a few moments about the biologic effects of radiation. <clears throat> Ionizing radiation, as I mentioned, is delivered through photons, which contain sufficient energy to break chemical bonds. Non-ionizing radiation can only produce thermal effects and heat and cannot alter DNA. So that's really important to remember. So if a patient comes to you and says, gee, I just had an MRI yesterday, is it safe for me to have a CT? The answer is an MR does not use ionizing radiation at all, only CT, and we use the smallest dose that we can to get the information that the physician needs for the diagnosis or treatment of your disease. There was a scientific report published a number of years ago on the biologic effects of ionizing radiation. And the summary I think is really helpful. Radiation effects, we're talking about ionizing radiation, are indistinguishable from those that occur without radiation exposure. For example, cancer and skin erythema occur in populations who have not received radiation doses. The only difference is cataracts because cataracts, it turns out, have a slightly different appearance when you look when the physicians look carefully. Uh, Radiation-induced cataracts look different than cataracts that come just from old age. But in general, they, they're the same, they're indistinguishable. So since the effects such as cancer and skin erythema are indistinguishable from those who did not get radiation, the radiation effects are inferred from looking at the statistics and seeing how many excess cases were present compared to what would have been expected. Radiation is not particularly effective at producing these effects such as skin cancer and skin erythema. So there are two types of effects. Stochastic effects are where the severity of the response is the same, regardless of the dose, only the probability of having it happen is affected. And examples are cancer induction and the latency period for cancer induction is greater than 10 years on the whole. So that's stochastic effects. Non-stochastic effects are those where the severity of the response is directly related to dose, and there is a threshold below which no response is seen. Skin yeah. erythema is an example. So stochastic effects and non-stochastic effects. So in terms of stochastic effects, there is a chance, less than one in one million, that you will win the, the lottery if you buy a ticket. So the more tickets you buy, the greater your chances of winning the lottery. But if you win, you win the same amount. So that's a stochastic effect. Let's say that you miss two days of work in a year. If that happens, you will probably not lose your job because you're, you're below the threshold. 
On the other hand, if you miss 200 days in a year, you will very likely lose your job. So there's a threshold below which you are okay and above which you're going to be in trouble. So let's look at the biologic effects and what we know about radiation dose and risk. What we know is that at high doses, we know that there are significant effects. So for example, at high doses, if everybody in, in this in this uh, seminar right now were to take a whole, eat a whole bottle of aspirins, we know that a lot of us would get sick. But on the other hand, if everybody on this seminar were to eat one aspirin a day for a month, then not only would most of us not get sick, it might actually be good for us. There's an example of where we know what the do effects are at high doses, but not so much at low doses, so we have to extrapolate them. And that's what happens with radiation. So at low doses, we have to estimate and extrapolate the risk. Well, risk is always needs to be balanced with benefit. Ionizing radiation is overwhelmingly beneficial in medicine. It's an effective tool to improve quality of care. And the theoretical adverse health effects are not fully understood because we know that there's a significant percentage of our population, for example, that develops cancer, whether they have radiation or not. So it's very hard to know exactly what the potential risks are of small doses of radiation. So that's sort of the end of the most the more technical part. Let's get back to a little more of the practical stuff. What about occupational exposure? Well, for all of us who work with radiation, we are occupationally exposed. And the rules say that the risk from radiation exposure for us must be comparable to the risks of other people in what are generally considered safe professions. And what does that mean? Well, even in safe professions, like working in an office, accidents happen, things happen. And if you look at all the statistics of all the office workers, for example, in a year, you will find that some people have injuries and have health problems. They want the risk from radiation to be the same type of risk. And that's where the maximum radiation doses are set for occupational workers like us. The term ALARA stands for as low as reasonably achievable. There is a regulatory limit in each state that says this is the maximum that you are allowed to receive as a worker, but ALARA says we want to make it as low as reasonably achievable. We know that lower dose carries lower risk, but it also may add cost and may add other problems. You have to stop somewhere because there's always some natural background radiation that we're never going to get rid of. So for example, think about anybody who works in a, an area where there is fluoroscopy. You probably know that lead aprons are worn. Now the lead aprons that are worn stop maybe between 90 and 95% of the radiation. Well, you could wear two lead aprons and that would stop 99% of the radiation, but that would weigh twice as much. And there's a limit to how much weight people can realistically carry on their bodies without getting into other problems. So that's where the concept of ALARA comes in, in terms of radiation safety. Personnel monitoring is used by many of us to monitor, in other words, to measure and re maintain a permanent record of our occupational radiation exposure. The dosimeters, the little devices that measure radiation, are changed monthly or quarterly and interpreted by an accredited laboratory. Reports are sent to facilities and are available for your review. In most states, it's required to wear a badge like this if you are likely to receive 10% of the maximum permissible level of radiation. If, if you're way below that, then most states say you do not have to wear a badge as long as you can prove from some historical data that you're below 10%. The units that we use to measure radiation, I've said earlier, were the Rentgen, the RAD, organ doses are gonna be in RADs or in milligrays. And in CT, we often use a term called CTDI. That is not a dose to a human being. That is the dose to a 16 or a 32 centimeter diameter acrylic phantom. It's really more a measure of the output of the CT scanner, but it is a method that we use to compare. These are measured quantities. The effective dose that you sometimes see is actually a calculated quantity.
So there are occupational monitoring reports available to you. And the way you read them is you want to look at, look for your name on a report. And every manufacturer has a slightly different version. Look for the current month, the current calendar quarter, and the year to date. So here's an example that's too small to read, but then I'll blow up a small section of it. And here's the name of a, of a couple of people. Here are the whole body doses and so on. And this is the number of millirem. In this example, M means below the measurable va minimum value. Occupational limits, by the way, do not apply to office staff. They only apply to those who actually work with radiation exposure. And the occupational limit for the whole body is 5,000 millirem per year, TEDE, which means total effective dose. The limit for extremities is 10 times as high. This includes contributions from all facilities if you work at multiple facilities. I'm not sure why my computer is doing this. I think my mouse is a little sensitive. So here's a summary table of the occupational dose limits. You can see that the whole body limit is 5 rem per year or 5,000 millirem per year. The lens is 15 times higher, 15, uh, three times higher, 15 millirem. Extremities are 50, and the limit for, for fetal exposure is 0.5, and for the general public is 0.1 per year. I've mentioned that already. So again, the risk occupational is similar to risk of other safe professions. There is an annual report that is mandated in some states that you receive of your annual exposure if you're being provided with a, with a badge, with a monitor. So the last couple of things I'd like to talk about are protection from radiation, radiation pregnancy, and CT dose. So let's talk about protection. <clears throat> the, the occupational limits we've already talked about they exist in the NRC world for those who use radioactive materials, but each state has, has a guidance document, has its own requirements. The pregnancy declaration is generally required by states because that's what's used in the NRC world. And <clears throat> what you need to do is in terms of patients who may be pregnant, you want to ask the patient before the procedure, is there a chance that they might be pregnant? and you should know what your facility procedure is. Now know that for many cone beam CT exams, for example, of the head and extremities, the dose to the, to the pelvis for a, uh, someone who is potentially pregnant is practically zero. So it does not mean that the patient could not have the CT exam. And even in a whole body CT, under certain circumstances, it may be perfectly appropriate to perform a CT scan on someone who is potentially pregnant. That's why you have to look at your own procedures and know what they say. Follow those procedures. In terms of protecting ourselves from radiation, the three essentials are time, distance, and shielding. The first is the less time that any of us spend in a radiation area, the less the radiation dose. Or in general, if everything else is the same, the shorter the radiation exposure, the shorter the radiation dose. So time is pretty straightforward. <clears throat> now distance is the opposite in that the higher the distance, the lower the radiation dose. And <clears throat> the inverse square law describes that relationship. A simple example is that if an exposure rate is let's say 10 MR per hour, in other words, if you were at a point in, uh, near an x-ray source that you were going to get 10 MR if you stayed there for an hour, and that was at a distance of one meter. If you doubled your distance to two meters, the dose goes down by two squared or four, so it goes from 10 to 2.5 MR per hour. As a practical matter, what this means is you want to be as far away from the source of radiation exposure as you reasonably can and still be able to do what needs to be done. The third method is shielding. So uh, most CT scanners have some sort of a shielded enclosure. If it's a whole body CT scanner, the room will be lead lined and there will be a control booth with 
lead glass windows. <clears throat> if it's a, a cone beam CT scanner, it may not be lead lined, or there may be some movable lead shields that are in place around the scanner. But also it's, it's perfectly reasonable to have the shielding be provided by the walls in the room. That's part of the responsibility of the medical physicist is to measure the, the radiation exposure to operators and to people near a CT scanner to make sure that it's safe. <clears throat> so the way we do that, and this is part of a medical physicist report, is we make a little sketch of the CT area, and then we take measurements at a number of different locations. You can see they're shown here. <clears throat> we describe what the barrier is. Is it a window? Is it a door? Is it a wall? And we describe the use. Is it a corridor or a closet where nobody hardly ever goes? And then we use standardized assumptions to determine whether the radiation levels are less than they are required to be. And if they were not, then we would inform the facility and say you need to make some changes. This is important, especially in dental cone beam CT, because many installers are removing panoramic x-ray machines, which although they look like cone beam CT, they actually use a much, much smaller size radiation beam and produce much less scatter. So you cannot necessarily pull out a panoramic x-ray machine and insert a cone beam CT machine without doing some calculations to see if additional shielding is needed. Now, if nobody is going to be anywhere near it, and if you've got 8 or 10 or 12 feet of distance, then the distance protects everybody. Remember, it was time shielding and distance that reduces the dose. So that may be sufficient, but that's the job of the medical physicist to determine and to provide a report for each facility. And IAC requires this when a new machine is installed or when there are changes to the machine or the facility or when it's moved. So how do you minimize your exposure? <clears throat> well, you wanna stay in the operator's control location during the x-ray exposure. That's an area where the medical physicist has measured the dose and it's usually very close to zero. You should wear a lead apron if you must be inside the room with the patient. You should check your badge readings regularly if you are wearing badges, if you're issued them, and consult with your medical physicist if you have questions. So let's, our final topic is gonna to be, let's talk about CT dose. <clears throat> so CT dosimetry is actually a complicated topic and medical physicists spend a lot of our time reading and understanding and learning it, but I'd like to give you enough information so that you can understand and converse with a medical physicist and perhaps read the medical physicist's report. So I used this slide before to remind you that CTDI is not the dose to a patient, but it's the dose to a 16 or 32 centimeter diameter phantom. Well, if it's not the patient dose, what good is it, you might ask? Well, the reason is that research has been done on many, many different by many different facilities and many different organizations, and they have published recommended ranges of doses in CTDI for different exams. So it's not a patient dose, but it's a range that can be used for comparison. And that's part of what the physicist does. We measure the doses and then we compare them with a reference standard. Sometimes these are done with calculated parameters such as effective dose. So let me give you some examples. By the way, in terms of the rads and the, and, the, and the grays and so on, if you ever have trouble remembering them, and I did for a while until somebody told me that a rad is like a penny and a gray is like a dollar. So that's where the factor of 100 to 1 comes from. So in multi-detector CT, <clears throat> there are different dose descriptors that are not really designed for cone beam CT. The CTDI is the primary one. And that's the dose, as I said, to a cylindrical phantom. The physicist measures it. The big one is 32 centimeters in diameter. That's the, supposed to simulate the size of a large abdomen or pelvis. And 16 centimeters, which would simulate the size of a head or perhaps a pediatric patient. There is also a term that's used, especially in cardiology literature, the dose length product. And that's the CTDI times the length of the patient that is exposed. It's another way to compare. 
And if you're looking at a conventional CT scanner, you might see a screen that looks something like this. So it'll say, here's the CTDI vol in milligray for images number 1 to 52, and the second set was around 10, give or take. The DLP, the dose length product, is the CTDI times the length of the scan. So since that's about 10 and the DLP is about 28, uh, 280, the length of the scan is about 28 centimeters because it's, it's the CTDI times the length in centimeters. And this explains which phantom was used for that calculation. <clears throat> so in a, in a cone beam CT scanner, you might see a display that often looks like this with the three different projections, and then there's some data in the corner. So here's a bigger view of that data. It shows the patient information, <clears throat> and this, this shows that the, the kilovoltage was 90, 6MA was used, 17.5 seconds. This scanner reports CTDI of 10.4 milligray and did not report a DAP, which is another unit that's sometimes used, but that's also available on some scanners. The DAP is the dose area product, or some people call it the KERMA area product, and it's used by some systems in cone beam, especially in Europe. And as we know, the dose decreases as we get further away from the X-ray source, but the area increase increases by the same amount. So the dose times the area is a constant. And that's one of the reasons why some uh, manufacturers and some medical physicists like the dose area product or the KERMA area product. We talked about the effect of dose. Some, if you are receiving values that look like sieverts or millisieverts or microsieverts, those are going to be effective dose values. Remember that effective dose is calculated and is not measured. It is by definition, and this is what the definition of effective dose is, an estimate of the amount of dose that a whole body dose would produce to give you the same level of risk from the, the dose that went to, not, to less than the whole body. Let me say that again. We have patients who don't get whole body doses. None of our CT scanner patients receive whole body doses. That number is the equivalent of a whole body dose that would give the same effects. And it allows us to compare that with Hiroshima and Nagasaki and other data. And the unit of effective dose is the sievert or milli or microsievert. The risk of cancer induction from radiation dose depends on the organs receiving the dose. So, for example, uh, different organs have different factors. In, the, in an extremity CT scanner, for example, where only the leg is being ex exposed, there are no critical organs being exposed. Air KERMA is another unit that is more and more commonly being used for cone beam CT, and it's measured by putting a radiation dose detector on the image receptor and compared with reference standards, reference values. Well, what about organ dose versus risk? We can measure the dose to an organ, and as I mentioned, the risks come from Hiroshima and Nagasaki survivors. We use tables published by the ICRP, the International Commission on Radiation Protection, and we use those to estimate the risk. But how should they be used? Well, here's a paper from a few years ago that explains this, and the key message here is that these reproaches are not for an individual dose, they're for populations. So it is not appropriate to use an effective dose for an individual person. However, for example, I saw on the internet that one uh, facility was giving dose cards to their patients saying, here's your dose in millisieverts. So that's totally wrong. Millisieverts should never be applied to an individual. They're only applied to populations. And again, your medical physicist understands the details of this. Check with her or him if you have questions. <clears throat> Cone beam CT historically used little detectors to measure the radiation dose inside head phantoms. Well, how much is the dose from a cone beam CT? So if we compare a CT of the maxilla and the mandible <clears throat> on a whole body CT scanner, 
And then we look at a cone beam CT, we see that the dose is less than half on this slide. If we compare it with dental x-rays, we see dental x-rays are even substantially lower than that. So <clears throat> let me finish by saying there are many ways to answer your patient's questions about dose. I'd recommend that you try to avoid technical answers if patients ask about dose, unless they really push for it. Most patients don't wanna know about numbers or units. Emphasize that the benefits to you as a patient far outweigh the risks and your doctors have made that judgment. Another thing you can say is we use the least amount of radiation we can to achieve the quality we need for your care. I think that's, the, in my opinion, that is the most effective, the least amount of radiation we can to achieve the quality we need for your care. <clears throat> if you're using cone beam CT scanners, you can say, honestly, that cone beam CT doses are much lower than whole body CT scanners, if there was a whole body CT scanner that was doing the same thing. Another thing you can say is that we utilize a board-certified medical physicist to measure and optimize our doses and image quality, if in fact that's a true statement. IAC requires that you use a medical physicist. Most of them are board-certified, but we also allow some others to do the work. <clears throat> and the last thing you might say is that we are accredited by the Intersocietal Accreditation Commission. One of the examples that I find uh, resonates well with, with patients is this one. And this goes back to, we use just the right amount of radiation dose to see what, what the doctors need to see. Think about doing fine needle work. Anybody who's ever done it knows that you, it's very difficult to do if the lighting is not good. If it's too dark, you really can't see what you're doing. <clears throat> On the other hand, if it's brilliant sun outside, it's really hard to see too because there's too much light, there's glare. There's a sweet spot, just the right amount of light to do fine detail work. And that's the way we should explain and view the amount of radiation dose that we use in CT. The manufacturer and the physicists and the physicians and the radiologic technologists all work together to come up with protocols that use just the right amount of radiation dose to achieve the clinical result, not too much, not too little. So what we've done is we've talked about a bunch of different things in the last uh, 45 minutes, the nature of radiation, the terminology that we use, the sources of radiation, <clears throat> the biologic effects, the stochastic and the non-stochastic effects, <clears throat> the radiation risks and benefit, which is maybe one of the most important principles We've talked about your own uh, exposure and safety because you are occupationally exposed. And the way we measure that through personnel monitoring, if necessary, if you're gonna be getting more than 10% of the maximum permissible exposure. We've talked about how to protect yourself from radiation using time, distance, and shielding, radiation and pregnancy. And we've just started to talk about describing CT dose. So at this point, I would like to remind you about a few practical steps for CT safety. Remember to double check the patient ID, you all know this. Double check the right test, carefully position the patient, use dose reduction modes if available according to your protocols. Check the dose index to make sure that what was delivered was within the expected range. Uh, dose check is something we didn't get into, but if you have an XR29 compliant system, dose check will help you with that. Uh, consider lead aprons, but in general, we're not, we're not em emphasizing lead aprons anymore. Lock your protocols so they cannot be changed. Review your protocols with a medical physicist. We are required to do this once a year when we visit your facility and follow your QC program. So at this point, I'd be happy to uh, entertain some questions. And Nancy has been monitoring to see what the questions might be. So Nancy, maybe you could let me know what questions folks might have. Hi, thank you very much. So one of the first questions was related to the uh, staff members' radiation badges. And one of the questions was, should they provide that so that they can get the information 
within a month or should they only get this quarterly? That is their question, which is better? Okay, so I think the question is about should they provide the reports? So it varies a little bit by state. Pretty much every state requires that you receive an annual report. Many states require it more often or require it that it be available. But that really wasn't the question. The question was what's better? So I wanted to start with the regulation. So you need to find out what your regulation is to make sure you're in compliance. In my opinion, it's much better for anybody who's occupationally exposed to just look at their monthly report or quarterly whenever it comes out. Some badges are exchanged monthly, some quarterly. And why is that? Well, because if you ever were to have a number that were higher than your typical amount, if you wait till the end of the year, you'll never remember what might have been different. So it's, it's valuable, in my opinion, to ask to look at your badge report whenever it is available. And that may be monthly or it may be quarterly. It may be a, a paper report that's issued, but it may also be online. And again, you need to just ask the person who is in charge of radiation safety at your facility uh, that question. Remember, though, that if, you, if the facility has demonstrated that nobody gets more than 10% of the maximum permissible exposure, then they are not required to provide occupational exposures. Those monitors are not required. Thank you very much. And the next question is, what is the great benefit to have the lead aprons? Should they just have one for their patient or several for their staff members? What would be the great benefit? Well, this is a funny question. Not a funny question. It's a funny answer. The truth is that it depends on the type of scanner you have, right? So let's start with the simplest. If you have a, uh, a, a scanner that only scans the head, like if you're an ENT office, then in reality, the dose to the body of a patient is practically zero. On the other hand, patients feel safe when you give them a lead apron, and you need to look and see what your policy says and follow your policy. There is no consensus as to whether you should or should not provide an apron. There are pluses and minuses of each. Frankly, wearing one is not really helping a lot, but sometimes patients get upset if you don't give them an apron and it takes a long time to try to answer their questions and they're still upset. So some practices say, well, it's not hurting anything. Let's just give them the apron. So that's the argument there. In terms of staff, the reason to have one available for staff is if somebody had to be in with a patient during an exposure and could not be in the control area. So you may have a patient who requires personal attention so it is important to have a lead apron available in that situation. It may be rare, but you may have a patient, patient who's a little unsteady, who requires some in-person reassurance. That might be a parent. It might be a caregiver. Uh, so any of those situations would benefit from having a lead apron because you should not be in the scanner room without one. Thank you. And all right, one last question for you. So if a facility does have a new CT unit installed, do they need to have the physicists do the shielding survey outside of their CT suite? That's a great question. And the answer is yes. So remember that whenever a new scanner is installed, the facility is required to have the medical physicist come and evaluate the scanner and I didn't get into this detail, but we measure not only doses for your, according to your protocols, but we also measure the quality of the image using a substantial number of, of technical quantitative measures using special phantoms. That's what we do. Uh, so the physicist has to come. And every physicist knows that for a new scanner, you must also demonstrate that the area is safe around that scanner. We call it a radiation protection survey. IAC does require this. So to, to state it again succinctly, when a new scanner is installed, a physicist must come evaluate the radiation dose and image quality and also perform a radiation protection survey 
to measure the radiation doses in the areas nearby to make sure it's safe for you and other staff and maybe people in the adjacent suite if it's on a, that kind of a wall and so on. So that, that is required. IAC requires an annual medical physicist visit thereafter, but if the machine is not moved and there's no new machine, they do not need to repeat the radiation protection survey because nothing has changed. They need to only do the dose and the image quality evaluation. Okay, thank you very much. And now we'll go back to Michelle. All right, thank you again, everyone. A very special thank you to Bob Zutielo for his presentation today. Please feel free to contact IAC with any questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. To receive continuing education credit for this webinar, please complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. On the left side of the My Account page, you'll click on Webinars. Look for the title of this session, Introduction to Radiation Safety for CT. Beneath this title, you will click Review Event. On the left, select the Evaluation tab, then click Take Evaluation to complete the survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and any time thereafter through the CE Transcript section of the My Account page. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and appreciate your participation. <laughs>